Oh, hello, everybody! Welcome to Conk's Corner! My name is John Voth. Mark is over there. Uh, he's my, my roommate. He's joining in. And today, Dexter's not there. He, um, okay, everybody. Well, first of all, for those just joining in, I am reading Harry Potter every single day. Never read it before. Um, I have only seen two of the movies. I don't remember anything from them, so it's all new to me. So please, no spoilers in the chat. Now, uh, reason for Dexter not being there is because uh, I, <laughs> I, I sprained my ankle yesterday, and that was just from walking. I just walked, I stepped over something, I rolled my ankle like crazy, then I was like down on the ground outside of A&W with my, with like, my, my track pants on, kind of a dirty shirt with my shoes off, going, ah, ah. I, I think it looked like I was just like a homeless person this side of A&W. <laughs> And so now I, I tried to go for a walk with Dexter today in the morning, but um, I just couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. So I handed him off to a friend of mine who's taking care of him right now. So that's what's happening with Dexter. Um, let me see here. What, what else is there to say? Oh, internet's a bit slow. Something just humpled around there. Um, uh, yes, I, I, I didn't read yet yesterday, so I might go a little long today. Again, just to catch up whatever you might have missed yesterday. But I'm excited to get back into this. This is a saxophone version of Harry Potter. Saxophone version. Okay, let's go back to the normal music. Okay, I'm excited. I'm excited because uh, I, I feel like something's going to happen in this these chapters. I don't know why. I just feel like something exciting is going to happen. This is what happens when you walk. You're right, Josh. I should stop walking. I'll just sit here and feel just so athletic. Zero exercise. Zero exercise is the way to live. It's the healthy way to live. They're saying nowadays that, you know, exercising is bad for you. Yeah. Because it's dangerous. So. Are, who? Yeah, they, they are saying that? Yeah, that's, that's what saying. Who is they? It's a, it's a new diet. Uh, <laughs> but not exercising is the new diet. Gotcha. <laughs> All right, this might be a little too loud. It's like paleo and CrossFit. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> Okay, let's get this started. So what happened last time? Oh yeah, there were um, there was a parent fight between Sirius and between um, Mrs. Dursley, and uh, it just came out no no resolution of who the actual parent is, but none of them are biological. Um, <laughs> and then they they went around trying to capture little monsters who live in every household apparently. Okay. Welcome to the I sprained my ankle uh, by, uh, with my third university crutches. Oh, it's a bit cut off, isn't it? Hey, they cut the chat here. Um, I'll fix that. I'll fix that. Everybody can see me fixing this. Whoa. Oh, gosh. <laughs> well, okay. I don't know how to fix this. <laughs> but, uh, oh, no. Actually, wait, I do. Ha, 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 ha. It's a bit smaller. Sorry, everybody. But um, if you're going to fix something, you got to fix something. All right, well, that's that. Okay, let's get this started. Where were we? We're at the top of page 98. Uh, uh, Fred and George came in. <coughs> that's, what we're, that's what we're putting in the adverts anyway, whispered Fred, who had edged over out of Mrs. Weasley's line of vision and was now sweeping a few stray doxies from the floor and adding them to his pocket. But they still need a bit of work. At the moment, our testers are having a bit of trouble stopping themselves puking long enough to swallow the purple end. Testers. I know we've already done this, but I'm just going to do this for re rehash. Us, said Fred. We take it in turns. George did the fainting fancies. We both tried the nosebleed nougat. Mom thought we'd been dueling, said George. Joke shop still on then, Harry muttered, pretending to be adjusting the nozzle on his spray. Well... We haven't had a chance to get premises yet, said Fred, dropping his voice even lower as Mrs. Weasley mopped her brow with her scarf before returning to the attack. So we're running it as a mail order service at the moment. We put advertisements in the Daily Prophet last week. All thanks to you, mate, said George. But don't worry, <laughs> Mum hasn't got a clue. <laughs> she won't read the Daily Prophet anymore because of it telling lies about you and Dumbledore. Harry grinned. He had forced the Weasley's tw Weasley twins to take the Thousand Galleons prize money he had won in the Triwizard Tournament to help them realize their ambition to open a joke shop. But he was still glad to know that his part in furthering their plans was unknown to Mrs. Weasley. She did not, she did not think running a joke shop was a suitable career for two of her sons. Glasses. My gosh, what have I done? I knew, I, I felt like, I was like, 
I guess we'll just start now, but it was something was missing. It was this. My gosh. Okay. Um, still, oh man, this is gonna throw me up. I'm just gonna have to do it by like by thinking. By thinking. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Not by looking. By thinking. I'm broken and traumatized. Yes. So the 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 um, the sprinting of the ankle really did me in. I I, I guess I just should should use a spell. By one, you don't bring your wand anymore. You should bring your wand next time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. thanks to Alicia Windquest. Heal your ankle. Yeah. Bambarlupa. Yeah, that's what that's. That's what about. they say. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, the de-doxing, the de-doxying of the curtains took most of the morning. It was past midday when Mrs. Weasley finally removed her protective scarf, sank into a sagging armchair, and sprang up again with, with a cry of disgust, having sat on the bag of dead rats. The curtains were no longer buzzing. They hung limp and damp from the in intensive spraying. At the foot of them, unconscious, Doxies lay crammed in the bucket beside a bowl of their black eggs, at which Crookshanks was now sniffing. Black eggs? These Doxies have black eggs? What are they... Hmm. I just don't like that. <laughs> I don't like black eggs. At which Crookshanks was now sniffing and Fred and George were shooting covetous looks. Oh, I think we'll tackle those after lunch. Mrs. Weasley pointed at the dusty glass-fronted cabinets standing on either side of the mantelpiece. They were crammed with an odd assortment of subject, uh, objects, a selection of rusty daggers, claws, a coiled snakeskin, a number of tarnished silver boxes inscribed with languages Harry could not understand, and, least pleasant of all, an ornate crystal bottle with a large opal set in the stopper, full of what Harry was quite sure was blood. Man, these blacks. Is, is Sirius Black um, a Slytherin? He seems like he would be a Slytherin to me. I don't know. Who, who, does anybody know that in the chat? What would... Uh, what would... Uh, well... Yeah, what, what else? Tasha, so I spy with my little eye. Three lava lamps, John, John. I've got six, okay? It's only half of it. <laughs> uh, the clanging doorbell rang again. Every, everyone looked at Mrs. Weasley. Stay here, she said firmly, snatching up the bag of rats as Mrs. Black screeches started up again from down below. <laughs> oh yeah, I forgot about her. I'll bring, that, I'll bring up some sandwiches. She left the room, closing the door carefully behind her. At once, everyone dashed over to the window to look down on the doorstep. They could see the top of an unkempt gingery head and a stack of precariously balanced cauldrons. Mundungus, said Hermione. What's he brought all those cauldrons for? Probably looking for, probably looking for a safe place to keep them, said Harry. Isn't what he was doing the night he was supposed to be tailing me? Picking up dodgy cauldrons? <laughs> yeah, you're right, said Fred, as the front door opened. Bundungus heaved his cauldrons through it and disappeared from, v from view. Blimey, mum won't like that. He and George crossed the, to, uh, to the door and stood beside it, listening closely. Mrs. Black's screaming had stopped. <laughs> I just find her so funny. Mundungus is talking to uh, talking to Sirius and Kingsley. Fred muttered, frowning with concentration. Can't hear properly. You reckon we can risk the extended ears? Might be worth it, said George. I could sneak upstairs and get a pair. But at that precise moment, there was an explosion of sound from downstairs that rendered extendable ears quite unnecessary. All of them could hear exactly what Mrs. Weasley was shouting at the top of her voice. We are not running a hideout for stolen goods! I love hearing Mum shouting at someone else, said Fred. <laughs> With a satisfied smile in his face as he opened the door an inch or so to allow Mrs. Weasley's voice to permeate, permeate, permeate? Yeah. Permeate the room better. Make such a nice change. Completely irresponsible, as if we haven't got enough to worry about with you dragging stolen cauldrons into the house. The idiots are letting her get into her stride, said George, shaking his head. <laughs> You've got to head her off early, otherwise she builds up a head of steam and goes on for hours. <laughs> and she's dying to have a go at Mundungus ever since he sneaked off when he was supposed to be following you, Harry. And there goes Sirius' mum again. Mrs. Weasley vo Miss Mrs. Weasley's voice was lost amid fresh shrieks and screams from the portraits in the hall. 
George made to, sh to shut the door to drown the noise. But before he could do so, a house elf edged into the room. Hey, maybe give me some adjectives for this uh, new house elf. What's that? What's that house elf's name again? Uh, creature. 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 Great. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> such a yeah, yeah. Camera. Just like what? What? <laughs> it's creature, John. <laughs> uh, okay. Is any uh, any uh, adjectives? Oh, just some some fighting about spo spoilers going on. Okay. Well, I'll just make a voice for creature. Unless uh, maybe you can keep track of any adjectives they come up with. Okay. Yeah. Um, except for the filthy rag tied like a loincloth around its, its middle, it was completely naked. Wow, a nudist in Harry Potter world? That's a first. Nudist little guys, little house elves. <laughs> <laughs> it looked... Uh, he's uh, like a grumpy old man. Okay, almost dead. Or wishes he would be dead. <laughs> Creature is crotchety and a little grumpy. Okay, okay. That's good. That's good. I won't make him similar to the other guys. Um, it, lo uh, it looked very old. Its skin seemed to be several times too big for it. And though it was bald like a house, el like all house elves, there was a quantity of white hair growing out its of its large bat-like ears. Its eyes were a bloodshot, were, were a bloodshot and watery gray, and its fleshy nose was large and rather snout-like. The elf took absolutely no notice of Harry and the rest, acting as though he could not see them. It shuffled, hunched back, slowly and doggedly, <laughs> doggedly towards the far end of the room, all the while muttering under its breath in a hoarse, deep voice like a bullfrog's. Oh, hoarse and deep for a house elf. Oh, I thought it would be like they all would be talking all, all up there. Okay, that's a bit that's a, throwing me off a bit. <laughs> wow, didn't expect this. Uh, uh, Wait, wait. <laughs> okay. Um, that was like a bullfrog. There we go. Like a bullfrog. Smells like a drain and a criminal to boot, but she's no better. Nasty old blood traitor with the brats messing up my mistress' house. Oh, my poor mistress. If she knew, if she knew the scum they've let into her house, what would she say to old creature? Oh, the shame of it. Mud bloods and werewolves and traitors and thieves. Poor old creature. What can he do? Is that, does that sound like him? <laughs> that sounds bullfroggy to me. <laughs> I like it. Yeah, uh, let me know. Let me know in the chat. <laughs> Hello, creature, said Fred very loudly, closing the door with a snap. Maybe not that deep. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, maybe like deep for a for a house elf, maybe, so so that I can understand. Right? Okay, maybe it's, it's, it's been quite unclear. <laughs> well, think about the way that bullfrogs croak. Rap, <laughs> rap. Well, I, don't, I don't know if they're that low. Brap, brap. I don't know if they're that high. Brap, brap. Right there. Okay. <laughs> I like your voice for him. Okay, it's so good, but so low I can hear you. Okay, so I'll keep it low, but I'll make it clear. How about that? Yeah. Hello, creature, said Fred very loudly, closing the door with a snap. The house elf froze in his tracks, stopped muttering, and gave a very pronounced and very unconvincing start of surprise, as if he wasn't, <laughs> as if he didn't notice him. More loathing. More loathing. Okay. Yeah. Creature, creature did not see young master, he said, turning around and bowing to Fred. Still facing the carpet, he added perfectly audibly, Nasty little, now it sounds a little bit, you know, like got him. Warp, warp. There we go. Nasty little brat, nasty little brat of a blood traitor it is. Sorry, said George. Didn't cut, uh, didn't catch, didn't catch that last bit. Creature said nothing, said Elf, with, said the Elf with a second bow to George, adding in a clear undertone. And there's its twin, a natural little beast they are. <laughs> if Kermit was voiced by Clint Eastwood. Okay, love it. Gives, <laughs> gives me Snape with a stuffed nose vibes. <laughs> totally. Yeah, you're in a mix between Jar Jar and Snape. Sure, sure, that works. That works. <laughs> 
Um, Harry didn't know whether to laugh or not. The elf straightened him, eyeing them all malevolently, and apparently uh, convinced that they could not hear him as he continued to mutter. And, there, and there's the mud blood standing there, bold as brass. Oh, if my mistress knew, oh, how'd she cry. And there's a new boy. Creature doesn't know his name. What is he doing here? Creature doesn't know. <laughs> okay, okay I, I like that. Like that. There's a little raspiness to it. Um, this is Harry, Creature, said Hermione tentatively. Harry Potter. Creature's pale eyes widened, and he muttered faster and more furiously than ever. Okay. Okay. <laughs> oh no, this is, this is gonna happen now. The, the mud blood is talking to Creature as though she is my friend. If Creature's mistress saw him in such company, oh, what would she say? Don't call her a mud blood, said Ron and Ginny together, very angrily. Okay, that kind of, that kind of works, I guess. Um, uh, so, uh, Harry Potter. Uh, sorry. Don't call her a mudblood, said Ron and Ginny together, very angrily. It doesn't matter, Hermione whispered. He's not in his right mind. He doesn't know what he's... Don't kid yourself, Hermione. He knows exactly what he's saying, said Fred, eyeing Creature with great dislike. Creature was still muttering his, heart, his eyes on Harry. Is it true? Is it Harry Potter? Creature can see the scar. It must be true. That's the boy who stopped the Dark Lord. Creature wonders how he did it. <laughs> oh, he's a fun character. He's just like an old grump. Uh, um, uh, don't we all, Creature, said Fredge. What do you want, anyway? George asked. Creature's huge eyes darted towards George. Creature's cleaning, he said ev <laughs> evasively. <laughs> oh, man. A likely story, said, uh, said a voice behind Harry. He's had a stroke. <laughs> <laughs> It feels like that character is just walking around with half a stroke constantly. <laughs> He's just survived for years, just having a constant stroke throughout all of it. <laughs> yeah, this is a house elf I like. You're right. Yep, for sure. I like him a lot. Uh, Sirius had come back. He was glowering at the elf from, from the doorway. The noise in the hall had abated. Perhaps Mrs. Weasley and Mundungus had moved their argument down into the kitchen at the si uh, in the kitchen. At the sight of Sirius, oh gosh, at the sight of Sirius, Creature flung himself into a ridiculously low bow that flattened his snout-like snout nose on the floor. Stand up straight, said Sirius impatiently. Now, what are you up to? Creature is cleaning. <laughs> The elf repeated, Creature lives to serve the noble house of black. And it's getting blacker every day. It's filthy, said Sirius. Master always liked his little joke. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, said Creature, bowing again and continuing in, in an undertone. Master is a nasty, ungrateful swine who broke his mother's heart. <laughs> Oh, wow. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. My mother didn't have a heart creature, snapped Sirius. She kept herself alive out of pure spite. Creature bowed down again as he spoke. 
Whatever Master says, he muttered furiously. Master is not fit to wipe slime from his mother's boots. Oh, my poor mistress, what would she say if she saw creatures serving him? How she hated him. What a disappointment he was. I asked you what you were up to, said Sirius coldly. Every time you show up pretending to be cleaning, you sneak something off to your room, so we can't throw it out. <laughs> These voices. Creature would never move anything from its proper place in Master's house, said the elf, then muttered very fast. Mistress would never forgive Creature if the tapest tapestry was thrown out. Seven centuries it's been in the family. Creature must save it. Creature will not let Master and the blood traitors and the brats destroy it. <laughs> he went from Gollum to Orc. <laughs> uh, I thought it might be that, said Sirius, casting a disdainful look at the opposite wall. She'll have to put another permanent sticking charm on the back of it, I don't doubt. But if I can get rid of it, I certainly will. Now go away, Creature. It seemed that Creature did not dare disobey a direct order. Nevertheless, the look he gave Sirius as he shuffled out past him was full of deepest loathing, and he muttered all the way out of the room, Comes back from us. Oh, sorry, where'd that go? Comes back from us, Caban, uh, ordering Creature around. Oh, my poor mistress. What would she say if she saw the house now? Scum living in it. Her treasure's thrown out. She swore he was no son of hers and he's back. They say he's a murderer too. <laughs> His voice is going all over the place. I know, I'm trying to figure him out. <laughs> Keep muttering and I will be a murderer, said Sirius ir irritably as he slammed the door shut on the elf. Sirius, he's not right in the head, Hermione pleaded. I don't think he realizes we can hear him. He's been, a he's been alone too long, said Sirius, taking mad orders from my mother's portrait and talking to himself. But he always, but he was always a foul little. If you could just set him free, said Hermione hopefully, maybe we, can we can't set him free. He knows too much about the Order, said Sirius curtly. And anyway, the shock would kill him. You suggest to him that he leaves this house, see how he takes it. Sirius walked across the room to where the tapestry creature had been trying to protect hung... Uh, the tapestry creature had been trying to protect hung the length of the wall. Harry and the others followed. The tapestry looked immensely old. It was faded and looked as though Doxies had gnawed it in places. I know how to drink. I don't know how to drink water. Um, the, tapestry, the tapestry looked immensely old. It was faded and looked as though Doxies had gnawed it in places. Nevertheless, the golden thread with which it was embroidered still glinted brightly enough to show them a sprawling family tree dating back, as fa far as Harry could tell, to the Middle Ages. Large words at the very top of the tapestry read, the noble and most ancient house of Black Toujours Pour, Toujours Pour. You're not on here, said Harry, after scanning the bottom of the tree closely. I used to be up there, said Sirius, pointing a small round charred hole in the tapestry, rather like a cigarette burn. My sweet old mother blasted me off after I ran away from home. Creature's quite fond of muttering the story under his breath. You ran away from home? When I was about 16, said Sirius, I had had enough. Where did you go? asked Harry, staring at him. Your dad's place, said Sirius. Your grandparents were really good about it. They sort of adopted me as a second son. Yeah, I camped out at your dad's in the school holidays. And when I was 17, I got a place of my own. My uncle Alfred, Alfred, had left me a decent bit of gold. He's been wiping off here, too. He's been wiped off here, too. That's probably why. Anyway, after that, I looked after myself. I was always welcome at Mr. and Mrs. Potter's for Sunday lunch, though. But why did you... Leave? Sirius smiled bitterly and ran his fingers through his long, unkempt hair. Because I hated a whole lot of them. My parents with their 
pure blood mania, convinced that to be a black, you may uh, to that to be a black made you practically royal. My idiot brother, soft enough to believe them. Oh, that's him. Sirius jabbed a finger at the very bottom of the tree at the name Regulus Black. A date of death some 15 years previously followed the date of birth. Okay, okay, here we go. Tom's voice is dry. He needs to voice it with some water. Are you happy now? Um... He was younger than me, said Sirius, and a much better son, as I was constantly reminded. But he died, said Harry. Yeah, said Sirius. Stupid idiot. <laughs> he joined the Death Eaters. You're kidding. Come on, Harry. Haven't you seen enough of this house to tell what kind of wizards my family were? Said Sirius testily. Were, were your parents Death Eaters as well? No, no. But believe me. They thought Voldemort had the right idea. They were all for the purification of the wizarding race, getting rid of muggle-borns and having pure bloods in charge. They weren't alone, either. There were quite a few people before Voldemort showed his true colors. Who thought he had the right idea about things? They got cold feet when they saw what he was, pre what he was prepared to do to get power, though. But I bet my parents thought Regulus was a right little hero. For joining up at first. Was he killed by an aura? Asked Harry tentatively. Oh no, said Sirius. No, he was murdered by Voldemort. Or on Voldemort's orders, more likely. I doubt Regulus was ever important enough to be killed by Voldemort in person. From what I found out after he died, he got in so far and panicked about what he was being asked to do and tried to back out. Well, you don't just hand in your resignation to Voldemort. It's a lifetime of service or death. Lunch, said Mrs. Weasley's voice. She was holding her wand high in front of her, balancing a huge tray loaded with sandwiches and cake on its tip. She was very red in the face and still looked angry. The others moved over to her, eager for some food. But Harry remained with Sirius, who had bent closely to the tapestry. I think this is... Yeah, this is serious. Okay. I haven't looked at this for years. This Phineas Nigellus, my great-great-grandfather, see? Least popular headmaster Hogwarts ever had. And Araminta Melifluor, cousin of my mother's, tried to force through a ministry bill to make muggle hunting legal. And dear Aunt Elidora... She started, the f she started the family tradition of beheading house elves when they got too old to carry tree, ca tree trays. Yeesh. Of course, any time the family produced someone halfway decent, decent, they were disowned. I see Tonks is not here. Maybe that's why Creature won't take orders from her. He's supposed to do whatever anyone in the family asks him. You and Tonks are related? Harry asked, surprised. Oh, yeah. Her mother, Andromeda, was my favorite cousin, said Sirius, examining the tapestry closely. No, Andromeda's not on here either. Look. He pointed to another small round burn mark between two names, Bellatrix and Narcissa. Andromeda's sisters are still here because they made lovely, respectable, pure-blood marriages. But Andromeda married a muggle-born. Ted Tonks. So... Sirius mimed blasting the tapestry with a wand and laughed sourly. Harry, however, did not laugh. He was too busy staring at the names to the right of Andromeda's burn mark. A double line of gold embroidery linked Narcissa Black with Lucius Malfoy, and a single vertical gold line from their names led to the name Draco. You're related to the Malfoys? The pure blood families are all inter interrelated, said Sirius. If you're only going to let your sons and daughters marry purebloods, your choice is very limited. There are hardly any of us left. Molly and I are cousins by marriage, and Arthur's something like my second cousin once removed. But there's no point looking for, for them on here. If ever a family was a bunch of blood traitors, it's the Weasleys. 
But ha okay, so related to the Drake, uh, the Malfoys, but not related to the Weasleys. Right. Okay, you're just so, just yeah. making sure. But Harry was now looking at the name to the left of Andromeda's burn, Bellatrix Black, which was connected by a double line to Rodolphus Lestrange. Lestrange? 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 Harry said aloud. <laughs> the name had stirred something in his memory. He knew it from somewhere, but for a moment he couldn't think where. Though it gave him an odd, creeping sensation in the pits of his stomach. They're in Ascom. They're in Azkaban, said Sirius shortly. Harry looked at him curiously. Bellatrix and her husband, Rodolphus, came in with Barty Crouch Jr., said Sirius in the same brusque uh -huh. voice. Huh? Yeah. Related to Molly and Arthur. He is related to Molly and Arthur. No, he just said Molly Weasley is his cousin. Related to both by blood, but more distantly. Okay, uh -oh. so is related, but not in a super important way. Okay, gotcha. Right, okay. Bellatrix and her husband Rodolphus came in with Barty Crouch Jr. Right, 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 okay. Right, said Sirius in the same brusque voice. Rodolphus' brother Rabastan was with them too. Then Harry remembered. He had seen Bellatrix, Bellatrix Lestrange inside Dumbledore's pensive, the strange device in which thoughts and memories could be stored. A tall, dark woman with heavy-lidded eyes, who had stood at her trial and proclaimed her continuing allegiance to Lord Voldemort. Oh. So Tonk, Tonks is born out of those parents. Oh, wow, okay. Her pride that she had tried to find him after his downfall, fall, and her conviction that she would one day be rewarded for her loyalty. You never said she was your... Does it matter if she's my cousin? Snapped Sirius. As far as I'm concerned, they're not my family. She's certainly not my family. I haven't seen her since I was your age, unless you count a glimpse of her coming into Azkaban. Do you think I'm proud of having a relative like her? Sorry, said Harry quickly. I, I didn't mean... I was just surprised, that that's all. Doesn't matter. Don't apologize, Sirius mumbled. He turned away from the tapestry, his hands deep in his pockets. I don't like being back here, he said, staring across the drawing room. I never thought I'd be stuck in this house again. Harry understood completely. He knew he would, how he would feel when he was grown up and thought he was free of the place forever to return and live at number four Privet Drive. Ooh. Yeah. Okay, why does, he, why does he not like Tonks, though? Why does who not like Tonks? Sirius. Tonks is his cousin, right? Sirius is fine with Tonks. Wait a sec. Oh, you know, he's talking about Bellatrix. I thought he, for some reason, he was talking about Tonks at that point. Oh, uh, no. Bellatrix is Tonks's aunt or something? Or... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. She married a muggle bone, so got burned up the tapestry. Right. Uh, <sighs> it's ideal for headquarters, of course, Sirius said. My father put every security measure known to wizard kind on it when he lived here. It's unplottable, so muggles could never come and call as if they'd ever wanted to. And now Dumbledore's added his protection. You'd be hard put to find a safer house anywhere. Dumbledore is secret keeper for the order, you know. Nobody can find headquarters unless he tells them personally where it is. That note Moody showed you last night, that was from Dumbledore. Sirius uh, gave a short, bark-like laugh. Ah! <laughs> that's, that's how Sirius laughs. No, it's different, it's different. Uh, 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 uh. Maybe something like that. If my parents could see the use their house was being put to now, well, my mother's portrait should give you some idea. He scowled for a moment, then sighed. Uh, I wouldn't mind if I could just get out occasionally and do something useful. I've asked Dumbledore whether I can escort you to your hearing, as snuffles, obviously, so I can give you a bit of moral support. What do you think? Harry felt as though his stomach had sunk through the dusty carpet. He had not thought about the hearing once since dinner the previous evening. In the excitement of being back with the people he liked best and hearing everything that was going on, it had completely flown his mind. At serious words, however, the crushing sense of dread returned to him. 
He stared at Hermione and the Weasleys, all tucking into their sandwiches, and thought how he would feel if they went back to Hogwarts without him. Don't worry, Sirius said. Harry looked up and realized that Sirius had been watching him. I'm sure they'll cl clear you. There's definitely something in the International Statute of Secrecy about being allowed to use magic to save your own life. But if they do expel me, said Harry quietly, can I come back here and live with you? Sirius smiled sadly. We'll see. But I'd feel a lot better about the hearing if I knew I didn't have to go back to the Dursleys, Harry pressed him. They must be bad if you prefer this place, said Sirius gloomily. Hurry up, you two! Well, there won't be any food left, Mrs. Weasley called. Sirius heaved another great sigh, cast a dark look at the tapestry, then he and Harry went to join the others. Harry tried his best not to think about the hearing while they emptied the glass-fronted cabinets this, that afternoon. Fortunately for him, it was a job that required a lot of concentration, as many of the objects in there seemed very reluctant to leave their dusty shelves. Uh, Sirius sustained a bad bite from a silver snuff box. Within seconds, his bitten hand had developed an unpleasant crusty covering like a tough brown glove. It's okay, he said, examining the hand with interest before tapping it lightly with his wand and restoring its skin to normal. Must be wart cap powder in there. He threw the box aside into the sack where they were depositing the debris from the cabinets. Harry saw George wrap his own hand carefully in a cloth moments later and sneak the box into his already doxy-filled pocket. They found an unpleasant-looking silver instrument, something like a many-legged pair of tweezers, which scuttled up Harry's arm like a spider when he picked it up. Silver is like many-legged pair of tweezers. Okay, weird. Which scuttled up Harry's arm like a spider when he picked it up and attempted to puncture his skin. Sirius seized it and smashed it with a heavy book entitled, entitled Nature's Nobility, A Wizarding Genealogy. There was a musical box that emitted a faintly sinister, tinkling tune when wound, and they all found themselves becoming curiously weak and sleepy until Ginny had the sense to slam the lid shut, a heavy locket that none of them could open, a heavy locket that none of them could open, a number of ancient seals, and, in a dusty box, an Order of Merlin first class that had been awarded to Sirius' grandfather for services to the ministry. That's What a fun house. What a fun house. I feel like it's almost... Uh, I, I haven't actually read the comic or watched the TV show, but that lock and key... Where the, all the keys in the house, it, yeah. it feels like that sort of house where there's like always something weird that you, Dory could go into. Mm -hmm. Kind of like Hogwarts, actually. Uh -huh. It means he gave them a load of gold, said Sirius contemptuously, throwing the metal into the rub rubbish sack. Several times... <laughs> Several times, creatures sidled into the room and attempted to smuggle things away under his loincloth, <laughs> muttering horrible curses every time they caught him at it. When Sirius wrested a large golden ring bearing the black crest from his grip, creatures, creature actually burst into furious tears and left the room sobbing under his breath and, <laughs> and calling Sirius names Harry had never heard before. That spot on lock and key was cool, but I feel like the Black House has a lot more bad things roaming about, probably. And you've pointed out Hogwarts is safe. Yeah, true. True that. Is sobbing under his breath and calling Sirius names Harry had never heard before. It was my father's, said Sirius, throwing the ring into the sack. Creature wasn't quite as devoted to him as to my mother, but I still caught him snogging a pair of my father's old trousers last week. Mrs. Weasley kept them all working very hard over the next few days. The drawing room took three days to, deca to decontaminate. Finally, the only undesirable thing left in it was the tapestry of the black family tree, which resisted all their attempts to remove it from the wall and the rattling writing desk. Moody had not dropped by headquarters yet, so they, so they could not be sure what was inside it. Uh, you, you know, funny comparing this to the first book, like, they have... Like, f four pages or five pages worth of just cleaning the house and talking. <laughs> right? <laughs> she could take the time now. <laughs> Where in the first book was like, and this happened, this happened. Here's like, yeah, we're talking about family history, doing a little bit of cleaning, and then we'll get to the adventure. 
Uh, the, the, oh yeah, the tapestry. There we go. They moved from the drawing room to to the di to a dining room on the ground floor, where they found spiders as large as saucers lurking in the dresser. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> I hate that. Hate that. Cause we'd all be like. <laughs> it's so bad we can't see it while it's happening because we're looking at the camera. I wish I could see this happening. I can, see it of the can you? Yeah. Oh no, I can't. <laughs> okay, um, the spiders, giant, giant spiders. Where were they? Where were the giant spiders? Oh, where were they? Uh, uh oh, I completely lost my place. To the dining room. Okay, there we go. Spiders as large as sa saucers lur lurking in the dresser. Ron left the room hurriedly, all right, to make a cup of tea and did not return for half an hour. <laughs> the china, which bore the black crest and motto, was all thrown unceremoni- unceremon- 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 Whoa. Unceremoniously. Unceremonious. Unceremoniously. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. Unceremoniously. Whoa, that, I could not, I, that was a real jump in my brain. <laughs> Unceremoniously, into, the, into a sack by Sirius, and the same fet, fate met a set of, <laughs> the same fet met, <laughs> the same fate met a set of old photographs in tarnished silver frames, all of whose occupants squealed shrilly as the glass covering them smashed. Snape might refer to their work as cleaning, but in Harry's opinion, they were really waging war on the house, which was putting up a very good fight, aided and abetted by Creature. The house elf kept, kept appearing where, wherever they were congregated. His muttering became more and more offensive as he attempted to remove anything he, he could, could from the rubbish sacks. <laughs> that guy's a jerk. I like him, though. I like him. <laughs> Sirius went as far as to threaten him with clothes. But Creature fixed him with a watery stare and said, Master must do as Master wishes, before turning away and muttering very loudly, but Master will not turn Creature away, no, because Creature knows what they are up to. Oh yes, he is planning against the Dark Lord, yes, with his mudbloods and traitors and scum. Uh, at which Sirius, ignoring Hermione's protest, seized Creature by the back of his loincloth and threw him bodily from the room. The doorbell rang several times a day, which was the clue for Sirius' mother to start shrieking again, and for Harry's, Harry and the others to attempt to eavesdrop on the visitor, though they gleaned very little from the brief glimpse and snatch, glimpses and snatches of conversation they were able to sneak before Mrs. Weasley recalled them to their tasks. Snape flitted in and out of the house several times more, though to Harry's relief they never came face to face. Harry also caught sight of his transfiguration teacher, Professor McGonagall. Oh, yeah! She back! She back! Oh, the girl is back! <laughs> Looking very odd in a muggle dress and coat, and she also seemed too busy to linger. Sometimes, however, the visitors stayed to help. Tonks joined them for a memorable afternoon in which they found a murderous old ghoul lurking in an upstairs toilet. <laughs> yes, yes. When you gotta go, <laughs> it's toilet time. It's toilet time. Thanks to, to Sayer for that one. Thanks to Sayer for creating that amazing amazing <laughs> toilet time okay and uh, there's like a lock in here leave me in here <laughs> it's tasty <laughs> um Murderous old ghoul lurking in an upstairs toilet, and Lupin, who was staying in the house with Sirius, but who left it for long periods to do mysterious work for the Order, helped them repair a grandfather clock that had developed the unpleasant habit of shooting heavy bolts at passers-by. 
Mundungus redeemed himself slightly in Mrs. Weasley's eyes by rescuing, rescuing Ron from an ancient set of purple robes that had tried to strangle him when he removed them from their wardrobe. That would probably have been such a fun scene. I hope that's in the movies. <laughs> Ron trying to get away from robes, trying to murder him. Murder him. Despite the fact that he was still sleeping badly, still having dreams about corridors and locked doors that made his scar prickle, Harry was managing to have fun for the first time all summer. That's nice. As long as he was, ver was busy, he was happy. When the action abated, however, when he dropped his guard or lay exhausted in bed watching blurred shadows from across the ceiling, the thought of the looming ministry hearing returned to, return to him. Fear jabbed at his insides like needles as he wondered what was going to happen to him if he was expelled. The idea was so terrible that he did not dare voice it aloud, not even to Ron and Hermione, who though he often saw them whispering together and casting anxious looks in his direction, following his lead, uh, followed his lead in not mentioning it. Sometimes he could not prevent his imagination showing him a faceless ministry official who was snapping his wand in two and ordering him back to the Dursleys. But he would not go. He was determined on that. He would come back here to Grimmauld Place and live with Sirius. He felt as though a brick had dropped into his stomach when Mrs. Weasley turned to him during dinner on Wednesday evening and said quietly, "'I'm wearing your best clothes for tomorrow morning, Harry.' And I want you to wash your hair tonight, too. A good first impression can work wonders. Hmm? Ron, Hermione, Fred, George, and Ginny all stopped talking and looked over at him. Harry nodded and tried to keep eating his chop, but his mouth had become so dry he could not chew. How am I getting there? he asked Mrs. Weasley, trying to sound unconcerned. Arthur ta Arthur's taking you to work with him, said Mrs. Weasley gently. Mrs. Weasley smiled encouragingly at Harry across the table. You can wait in the uh, um, you can wait in my office until it's time for the hearing," hmm? he said. Harry looked over at Sirius, but before he could ask the question, Mrs. Weasley had answered it. Answered it. Professor Dumbledore doesn't think it's a good idea for Sirius to go with you, and I must say, I think he's quite right," said Sirius through clenched teeth. Mrs. Weasley pursed her lips. "When did Dumbledore tell you that?" Harry said, staring at Sirius. He came, last um, he came last night when you were in bed, said Mr. Weasley. Sirius stabbed moodily at a potato with his fork. Harry lowered his own eyes to the plate. The thought that Dumbledore had been, the, been in the house on the eve of his hearing and not asked to see him made him feel, if it were possible, even worse. End of the chapter. Aww. Yeah, I feel bad for the guy. I feel feel bad for him. Damn, how someone can grow up in a house like that? It sounds very dangerous. It does, doesn't it? No, no wonder Sirius turned out like that and sounds like that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm wondering about Dumbledore. I'm wondering why he isn't showing up. What do you think? Do you have a premonition? Because maybe I have one. I just need to think about it first. I don't have a premonition. I just know that Dumbledore works in mysterious ways. <laughs> There's the the god analogy. <laughs> I didn't mean it like that. But, uh, but yeah, I, I think I think that like either he's too concerned with the other aspects. No, because like he's he's a sensitive a sensitive enough person where he could see that he would be a reassuring voice to Harry. So it's deliberate. Yeah, it is. It's for sure it's deliberate. It's deliberate, and... but I don't know why. Maybe because... I'm an idiot, idiot. It's time for John's premonition. Um, because Dumbledore has some kind of piece of information or something he has to tell him. He has to tell him if, if they meet. Maybe there's some kind of rule, like he has to tell him something and so he's not meeting up with him. There we go. Hello there, Lily Vandergreend. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> I read your last name wrong. I know exactly how to say it. Hi, Lily. Hey, welcome. I haven't seen you in a while. Is it a bunch of beanie babies in your bed next to Mark? What? No, it's a bouncy balls. Bunch of bouncy balls for um, for Dexter. Whole bunch of them. 
Ah. Okay, I'm gonna keep on reading. Next chapter. Chapter 7, The Ministry of Magic. Harry awoke at half past five the next morning as abruptly and completely as if somebody had yelled in his ear. For a few moments he lay immo immobile as the pro pro prospect of the disciplinary hearing filled every tiny, po tiny particle of his brain. Then, unable to bear it, he leapt out of bed and put on his glasses. Mrs. Weasley had laid out, laid out his freshly laundered jeans and t-shirt at, at the foot of his bed. Harry scrambled into them. The blank picture on the wall sniggered. <laughs> That's really funny. Blank. <laughs> blank picture. <laughs> nice. Hot. Ron was lying sprawled on his back with his mouth wide open, fast asleep. He did not stare, stir as Harry crossed the room, stepped out onto the landing and closed the door softly behind him. Trying not to think of the next time he would see Ron, when they might no longer be fellow students at Hogwarts, Harry walked quietly down the stairs, past the heads of creatures' ancestors, and down into the kitchen. He had expected it to be empty, but when he reached the door, he heard the soft rumble of voices on the other side. He pushed it open and saw Mr. and Mrs. Weasley, Sirius, Lupin, and Tonks, sitting there almost as though they were waiting for him. All were fully dressed, except Mrs. Weasley, who was wearing a quilted purple dressing gown. She leapt to her feet the moment Harry entered. Breakfast, she said, as she pulled at her wand and hurried over to the fire. Morning, Harry, yawned Tonks. Her hair was blonde and curly this morning. Sleep all right? Yeah, said Harry. I've been up all night, she said with another shuddering yawn. Come and sit down. She draw, drew out a chair, knocked over the one beside it in the process. What do you want, Harry? Mrs. Weasley called. Porridge? Muffins? Kippers? Picker and eggs? Picking and eggs? Toast? <laughs> just, just toast, thanks. Lupin glanced at Harry and said to Tonks, What were you saying about Scrimger? Scrimger? Scrimger. So that's a new word. Oh, yeah, well, we need a bit of, uh, we need to be a bit more careful. He's been asking Kingsley and me funny questions. Harry felt vaguely grateful that he was not re required to join the conversation. His insides were squirming. Mrs. Weasley placed a couple of pieces of toast and marmalade in front of him. He tried to eat, but it was like chewing carpet. Mrs. Weasley sat down on his other side and started fussing with his t-shirt, tucking in the label and smoothing out the creases across his shoulders. He, she, he wished she wouldn't. And I'll have to tell Dumbledore I can't do night duty tomorrow. I'm just... Oh, no, sorry, this is Tonks. And I'll have to tell Dumbledore I can't do night duty tomorrow. I'm just t t tired. Tonks finished, yawning hugely again. I'll cover for you, said Mr. Weasley. I'm okay. I've got a report to finish anyway. Mr. Weasley was not wearing wizard robes, but a pair of pinstriped trousers and an old bomber jacket. Wait. Bomber jacket. Uh, it might be a different description here. In Germany, bomber jacket were like these thick black jackets. That was a bomber jacket. What, what's a bomber jacket? Yeah, like, like isn't it? A, like an aviator kind of a jacket? Kind of yeah. Leather looking thing. Okay, yeah. gotcha. I think so. Man. Okay, Arthur Weasley, he's got some style. He probably, yeah, he's, he's probably a swagger. Uh, what do you think will happen at the hearing? What will the verdict be? Oh, okay. You want you want uh, you want a premonition from me? Is that what you want? Um, Harry will definitely be allowed to go back to Hogwarts. Duh. No doubt. That's what's gonna happen. It's just gonna happen. And if anybody disagrees with me, you know, take it up with Mark. <laughs> um. So he, he's definitely going to get his, he's going to, he's going to be, go, be able to go to Hogwarts, but he'll have his wand uh, taken from him this year. No, I don't know if it's going to happen the whole book, but they'll take it from him and he'll get it back at some point. That's my premonition. Like an extended period of time. Huh? You're, you're. Okay, it might be a new stream. I don't know if it's the same one.
Hello, everybody. Are we back? Are we back? Are we back? Yeah, okay, we're back. We are back. Okay, sounds good. I'm gonna keep on going. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be still be reading for a while. Okay. Uh, where were we? How are you feeling? Yeah. Um, how are you feeling? Harry shrugged. It'll all be over soon, Mr. Weasley said bracingly. In a few hours' time, you'll be cleared. Harry said nothing. The hearing's on my floor, in Amelia Bone's office. She's head of the Department of Magical Law Enforcement, and the, and the one who'll be questioning you. Amelia, Amelia Bones is okay, Harry, said Tonks earnestly. She's fair. She'll hear you out. Harry nodded, still unable to think of anything to say. Don't lose your temper, said Sirius abruptly. Be polite and stick to the facts. Harry nodded again. Look, the law's on your side, said Lupin quietly. Even underage wizards are allowed to use magic in life-threatening situations. Something very cold trickled down the back of Harry's neck. For a moment, he thought someone was putting a disillusionment charm, charm on him. Then he realized that Mrs. Weasley was attacking his hair with a wet comb. <laughs> she pressed hard on the top of his head. Doesn't it ever lie flat? She said desperately. Harry shook his head. <laughs> Mr. Weasley checked his watch and looked up at Harry. I think we'll go now, he said. We're a bit early, but I think you'll be better off at the ministry than hanging around here. Okay said Harry automatically, dropping his toast and getting to his feet. You'll be all right, Harry, said Tonks, patting him on the arm. Good luck, said Lupin. I'm sure you, I'm sure it will be fine. And if it's not, said Sirius grimly, I'll see to it, Amelia Bones, for you. Harry smiled weakly. Mrs. Weasley hugged him. We've all got our fingers crossed, she said. Right, said Harry. Well, see you later then. He followed Mr. Weasley upstairs and along the hall. He could hear his serious mother grunting in her sleep behind her curtains. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Uh, Mr. Weasley unbolted the door and they stepped out into the cold gray dawn. You don't normally walk to you don't normally walk to work, do you? Harry asked him as they set off briskly around the square. No, I usually operate, said Mr. Weasley. But obviously, but obviously you can't, and I think it's best we arrive in a thoroughly non-magical fashion. Makes a better impression, given what you are being disciplined for. Mr. Weasley kept his hand inside his jacket as they walked. Harry knew it was clenched around his wand. The run-down streets were almost deserted, but when they arrived at the miserable little underground station, they found it already full of early morning commuters. As ever, when he found himself in close pro proximity to muggles going about their daily business, Mr. Weasley was hard put to contain his enthusiasm. Ho 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 ho! simply fabulous, he whispered, indicating the automatic ticket machines. Wonderfully ingenious! <laughs> They're out of order, said Harry, pointing at the sign. Yes, but even so, said Mr. Weasley, beaming at them fondly. <laughs> Love him. He's so awesome. Uh... They brought their tickets instead from a sleepy-looking guard. Harry handed, handled tr the transaction, as Mr. Weasley was not very good with muggle money. And five minutes later, they were boarding an underground train that rattled them off towards the center of, the, of London. Mr. Weasley kept anxiously checking and rechecking the underground map above the door, above the windows. Four more steps, Harry. Ooh, three steps le left now. Oh, two steps left to go, Harry. <laughs> <laughs> they got off at a station in the very heart of London and were swept from the train in a tide of basalt besuited men and women carrying briefcases. Up the escalator they went, through the ticket barrier, Mr. Weasley delighted with the way the style swallowed his ticket, and emerged onto a broad street lined with imp imposing looking buildings and already full of traffic. Where are we? said Mr. Weasley blankly and for one heart-stopping moment, Harry thought they had got off the, at the wrong station, despite Mr. Weasley's continual references to the map. But a second later, he said, Ah, oh, yes, this way, Harry, and led him down a side road. Sorry, he said, but I never come by train, and it all looks rather different from a muggle perspective. As a matter of fact, I've never even used the visitor's entrance before. The further they walked the smaller and less imposing the buildings became, until finally they reached a street that contained several rather shab shabby-looking offices, offices, sorry, a pub and an overflowing skip. 
Harry had expected a rather more impressive location for the Ministry of Magic. Seven o'clock. Healthcare workers, we, we all gonna unite behind you. Wish I could help you operate on every single body. But no, you do because you're the best and you know how to do it best. We thank you. That's the worst song I've ever made in my life. I'm not even kidding you. Whoa, that was a bad one. I apologize. That was not properly celebrating you because I really brought it down with that song. <laughs> okay. We, we back at it. Um, where, where were we? Up the escalator tickets. Uh, more impressive location for the Ministry of Magic. Here we are, said Mr. Weasley brightly, pointing to an old red telephone box, which was missing several panes of glass and stood before a heavily gra graffitied wall. After you, Harry. He opened the telephone box door. Harry stepped inside, wondering what on earth this was about. Mr. Weasley folded himself in beside Harry and closed the door. It was a tight fit. Harry was jammed against the telephone apparatus, which was hanging crookedly from, a, from the wall, as though a vandal had tried to rip it off. Mr. Weasley reached past Harry for the receiver. Okay, did, did the Matrix come first, or did this book come out first? What, which year did this book come out? Because in the Matrix, they travel around by answering telephones, and they get zapped into the lines. Now, is this about to happen? Is this... A, did Rowling steal from... The Wachowski brothers? Sisters now, right. Sorry, I just uh, keep on reminding from them from back then. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. Did she, she, she steal? Is she, a, is she a thief? Mr. Weasley, I think this might be out of order too, Harry said. No, no, I'm sure it's fine, said Mr. Weasley, holding the receiver above his head and peering at the dial. Let's see. Six, he dialed the number. Two, four, and another four. And another two. As the dial whirred smoothly back into place, a cool female voice sounded inside the telephone box, not from the receiver in Mr. Weasley's hand, but as loudly and plainly as though the invisible woman were standing right beside them. Welcome to the Ministry of Magic. Please state your name and business. Uh, said Mr. Weasley, clearly uncertain whether or not he should talk into the receiver. He compromised by holding the mouthpiece to, to his ear. <laughs> Oh, uh, Arthur Weasley, misuse of Muggle Artifacts Office, here to escort Harry Potter, who has been asked to attend a disciplinary hearing. Thank you, said the cool female voice. Visitor, please take the badge and attach it to the front of your robes. There's a click and a rattle, and Harry saw something slide out of the metal chute where returned coins usually appeared. He picked it up. It was a square silver badge with Harry Potter dis disciplinary hearing on it. He pinned it to the front of his t-shirt as the female voice spoke again. Book came out four years after the movie. You see, The Matrix has just seeped itself into our subconscious, into every facet of pop culture. That's how influential that movie was back in the day. Now, The Matrix 2... Okay. Visit to the Ministry. You are required to submit to a search and present your one for registration at the security desk, which is located at the far end of the atrium. The floor of the telephone box shuddered. They were sinking slowly into the ground. Harry watched apprehensively as the pavement seemed to rise up past the glass windows of the telephone box until darkness closed over their heads. This might also be a callback to Get Smart. If anybody knows Get Smart, well, the movie came out with Steve Carell, but that's that was back in the 70s, I think, a TV show, or, or early 80s. Um, they, the spies would go in and then the telephone box would bring them down. Could be a callback to that too. So Matrix wasn't first then. Oh, it's it's always been first. <laughs> it's always been first because it talks about what how our world isn't real, right? And there's oh, the right, Matrix, right? right? So, right. Anyway, I don't have to explain myself. Just you know, read the book. <laughs> <laughs> um. They were sinking down into the ground. Then he could see nothing at all. He could only hear a dull grinding noise as the telephone box made its way down the earth. Sorry, one second. Um, made its way down the earth. After about a minute, though it felt much longer to Harry, a chink of golden light illuminated his feet and, widening, rose up his body until it hit him in the face and he had to blink to stop his eyes wandering. 
The, ma the Ministry of Magic wishes you a pleasant day, said the woman's voice. The door of the telephone box sprang open and Mr. Weasley stepped out of it, followed by Harry, whose mouth had fallen open. They were standing at one end of a very long and splendid hall with a highly polished dark wood floor. The peacock blue ceiling was inlaid with gleaming golden symbols that kept moving and changing like some enormous heaven, heavenly notice board. Okay, wait. Splendid hall. The peacock blue ceiling was in golden symbols. So they're just like moving and changing. They were just like changing places constantly or something like that. Okay, cool. Uh, check it out. I haven't uh, programmed all these yet, but this is kind of uh, what I can change into. Ooh. Oh, really changes the mood. And I can turn this off for, uh, for whatever monsters I might have to talk. And who knows? Yeah. But I've only got two of these programmed right now, so. But that's fun, huh? Uh, where, where were the... Where, where, where was the... They were moving about. There we go, okay. Um, the walls on each side were paneled in shiny dark wood and had many gilded fireplaces set into them. Every se few seconds, a witch or wizard would emerge from one of the left-hand fireplaces with a soft whoosh. On the right-hand side, short queues were forming before each fireplace, waiting to depart. Halfway down the hall was a fountain. A group of golden statu statues, larger than life-size, Larger than life size, stood in the middle of a circular pool. Tallest of them was a noble looking wizard with his wand pointing straight up in the air. Grouped around him were a beautiful were a beautiful witch, a centaur, a goblin, and a house elf. The last three were all looking ador adoringly up at the witch and wizard. Glittering jets of water were flying from the ends of their wands, the point of the centaur's arrow, the tip of the goblin's hat, and each of the house elf's ears, so that the tinkling hiss of falling water was added to the pops and cracks of the apparators. And the clatter of footsteps as hundreds of witches and wizards, most of whom were wearing glum early morning looks, strode towards a set of golden gates at the far end of the hall. Man, this place is majestic, very majestic and noble. Uh, no, it's it it actually looks darker on the screen because I did color correction too. <laughs> I'm just uh, I just put so much effort into it. <laughs> this way? What? 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 What do you have to say, Mark? <laughs> you were getting enough compliments without like I know <laughs> stroking your own ego. <laughs> uh. Uh, let's see. This this way, said Mr. Weasley. They joined the throng, wending their way between the ministry workers, some of whom were carrying tottering piles of parchment. Others battered briefcases. Still others were reading the Daily Prophet while they walked. Just business as usual. As they passed the fountain, Harry saw silver sickles and bronze nuts glinting up at him from the bottom of the pool. A small sun smudged sign beside it read, All proceeds from the Fountain of Magical Brethren will be given to St. Mungus Hospital for magical maladies and injuries. Well, that's nice. That's nice. If I'm not expelled from Hogwarts, I'll put in ten galleons. Harry found himself thinking desperately. Over here, Harry, said Mr. Weasley. And they stepped out of the stream of, mi of, stream of ministry employees heading for the Golden Gates, seated at the desk to the left, beneath, beneath a sign saying, Security. A badly shaven wizard in peacock blue robes looked up as they approached and put down his uh, daily prophet. I'm escorting a visitor, said Mr. Weasley, gesturing towards Harry. How does he look? This uh, baldly shaven wizard. Oh, yeah. Step over here, said the wizard in a bored voice. Harry walked closer to him and the wizard held up a long golden rod, thin and flexible as the car aerial and passed it up and down Harry's front and back. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Uh, Wand, grunted the security wizard at Harry, putting down the golden wizard and holding out his hand. Harry produced his wand. The wizard dropped it on a strange brass instrument, which looked something like a set of scales with only one dish. It began to vibrate. A narrow strip of parchment came speeding out of a th slit in the base. The wizard tore this off this off and read the writing on it. This is what this is. It's like a security booth. I love it. <laughs> Put this over here. Walk through. 
Now, it's gonna, what, what, how does it evaluate these wands? That's what I'm interested in. How do they evaluate wands? I, I like to think you pronounce the K in nut. Knut? I'm, I'm cool with that. I like that better, too. Thanks for the, for the suggestion. My mouth is so dry. Not anymore! 11, 11 inches. Fe Phoenix Feather Court. Been in use for four years. Is that correct? Yes, said Harry nervously. I keep this, said the wizard, impaling the slip of parchment on a small brass spike. You get this back, he added, thrusting the wand at Harry. Thank you. Hang on, said the wizard slowly. His eyes had darted from the silver visitor's badge on Harry's chest to his forehead. Thank you, Eric, said Mr. Weasley firmly. And grasping Harry by the shoulder, he steered him away from the desk and back to the stream of wizards and witches walking through the golden gates. Jostled slightly by the crowd, Harry followed Mr. Weasley through the gates into the smaller hall beyond, where at least twenty lifts, lifts stood behind wrought golden grills. Harry and Mr., Mr., Mr. Weasley joined the crowd around one of them. Nearby stood a big bearded wizard holding a large cardboard box which was emitting rasping noises. All right, uh, all right, Arthur, said the wizard, nodding at Mr. Weasley. What have you got there, Bob? asked Mr. Weasley, uh, Mr. Weasley, looking at the box. We're not sure, said the wizard seriously. We thought it was a bog standard chicken until it started breathing fire. Looks like a serious breach of the bound on an experimental breeding to me. With a great jank, okay, there's so much new information here. Okay, what a bog standard chicken until it started breathing fire. Breach of, on the ban of experimental breeding. Okay, so there's experimental magical magical creatures breeding? Oh, man. <laughs> well, yeah, isn't that how um, Hagrid made the, the blast ended spruits? True. Yeah. True. They were like his own babies, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. So he, what, he was doing something forbidden? It is forbidden. I mean, m maybe, but also they were in the Triwizard Cup, so maybe he was allowed. Maybe maybe there's you, you can breed stuff for a purpose, but not on your own without permission. Yeah, you probably need permission. Yeah, maybe. Something like that. Uh, where are we? I keep on losing my place in this one. Okay, here we go. With a great jangling and clattering, a lift ascended in front of them. The golden grill slid back, and Harry and Mr. Weasley stepped into the lift with the rest of the crowd. And Harry found himself jammed against the black back wall. Several witches and wizards were looking at him curiously. He stared at his feet to avoid catching anyone's eye, flattening his fringe as he did so. The grill slid shut with a crash, and the lift ascended, ascended slowly, chains rattling, while the same cool female voice Harry had heard in the telephone box rang out again. Level 7, Department of Magical Games and Sports, incorporating the British and Irish Quidditch League headquarters, official Gobstones Club, and ludicrous Pat Pitt... Patents office. A uh, whole bunch of new things again. Magical games and sports, incorporating the British and Irish Quidditch League. Okay, gotcha. The lift doors opened. Harry glimpsed an untidy looking corridor with various posters of Quidditch teams tack tacked lopsidedly on the walls. One of the wizards in the lift, who was carrying an ar armful of broomsticks, extricated himself with difficulty and disappeared down the corridor. The doors closed. The lift juddered upwards again, and the woman's voice announced, Level 6, Department of Magical Transport Transportation, Incorporating the Flu Network's Authority, Broom Regulatory Control, Port Key Office, and Apparition Test Center. What a, what a bureaucracy that this world has. It's so magical, and yet it has such a bureaucracy. <laughs> Once again, the lift doors opened and four or five witches and wizards got out. At the same time, several paper aeroplanes swooped into the lift. <laughs> <laughs> wait for us, guys. <laughs> no, he was like, hey guys, wait for us, here we are. <laughs> Be bordering on ASMR there, John. Am I? Yeah, maybe the, okay, the aeroplanes are total ASMR, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, uh, we're ASMR airplanes. It's just what we do. Everybody, so don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, Harry stared up at them as they flapped idly around above his head. They were pale violet color, and he could see Ministry of Magic stamped along the edge of their wings. Just interred departmental memos. <laughs> they are memos? That is awesome. <laughs> that is awesome. They are memos. <laughs> Mr. Weasley muttered to him. We used to uh, we used to use owls, but the mess was unbelievable. Droppings all over the discs. As they clattered, clattered upwards again, the memos flapped around the lamp, swaying from the lift ceiling. Level 5, Department of International Magical Cooperation, incorporating the International Magical Trading Standards Body, the, Interna the International Magical Office of Law, and the International Confederation of Wizards, British Seats. She's doing some world building in this one, holy smokes. When the, door op when the doors opened, two of the memos zoomed out with a few more of the witches and, and wizards, but several more memos zoomed in so that the light from the lamp flicked, flickered and flashed overhead as they darted around it. Yeah, this is bureaucracy in a whole new level. Ne new level. level four, Department for the Regulation and Control of Magical Creatures, in Incorporating Beast, Being and Spirit Division, Goblin Liaison Office and Pest Advisory Bureau. Scoots, scoots, said the wizard, carrying the fire-breathing chicken, and he left the lift pursued by a little flock of memos. The doors clanged shut yet again. Level 3, Department of Magical Accidents and catastrophe, Catastrophes, including the Accidental Magical Reversal Squad, <laughs> Obliviator Headquarters, and Muggle-Worthy Excuse Committee. Everyone left the lift on this floor except Mr. Weasley, Harry, and a witch who was reading an extremely long piece of parchment that was trailing on the floor. The remaining memos continued to soar around the lamp as the lift juddered upwards again. Then the doors opened, and the voice made its announcement. Level 2, De Department of Magical Law, Law Enforcement, including the Improper Use of Magic Office, Aura Headquarters, and Wizengamot Admis Administration Services. This is, this is us, Harry, said Mr. Weasley, and they followed the witch out of the lift into a corridor lined with doors. My office is on the other side of the floor. Mr. Weasley, said Harry, as they passed a window through which sunlight was streaming. Aren't we still underground? Yes, we are, said Mr. Weasley. Those are enchanted windows. Magical maintenance decided that what weather we'll get every day. We had two months of hurricanes last time. They were angling for a pay raise. <laughs> <laughs> Just round here, Harry. They turned a corner, walked through a pair of heavy oak doors, and emerged in a cluttered open area divided into cubicles, which was buzzing with talk and laughter. Memos were zooming in and out of cubicles like miniature rockets. A lopsided sign on the nearest cubicle read, Auror Headquarters. Okay, I'm going to end there. Seems like a good point to end. Question. Oh, yeah, questions. Do you have a question? I have a question. Okay. But you out can of, write some too. Out of all of those floors that they were on and all the different departments, which one of them would you want to work at the most? Oh gosh, okay. Uh, I was re I didn't think of that. Control of magical cre creatures, department of magical a accidents and catastrophes. Oh, that's like that's like a the medical level. That's the probably, medical level. Probably. Yeah. yeah. Um, level four. Magical creatures, that feels like the um, nature, taking care of nature <laughs> department. <laughs> Level 5, Department of International Magical Cooperation, including the International Magical Trading Center, its body, the International Magical Off. off. Oh, for sure, the creatures. The creatures. I just like to be around them. Yeah. Uh, you, you, you can keep on writing questions if you have any, but... Um, for those of you who are on uh, the Patreon tier, the, the top one, we are going to have a little hangout session after this. Uh, I've written onto Patreon. You can find the link for that on where we're going to hang out. So at 7.30, we'll be getting back together. Otherwise, uh, there's, here's, here's, some, here's some questions. What do you think of the Black family and their pure blood traditions? Well, I like Sirius most. I, just, I, I feel like I would feel like him. I mean, why? I mean, they're they're just like the well, the Malfoys are them. They're related, so no wonder they all feel the same. It's um, I don't know. Maybe it's a comparison to to racists. <laughs> maybe she's making a comparison between the two. That could very well be. Yeah, I'm not I'm not on their side. Don't like them. Don't like them at all. Okay, everybody. Hope you have a good evening. Uh, 
I want to leave you with this again. I hope you know that you are loved, you have purpose, you have value and meaning and all those good things. Don't forget that. Uh, and talk to somebody you love if you do. All right. Have a good evening. See you tomorrow at 6 p.m. once again for the rest of Kong's Co.